to uh, be able to introduce to everyone today. My name is Adrian Warnock and I'm here together uh, with Professor John Lennox from Oxford, is that right? It is indeed. I live just outside Oxford in a village on the edge of the Cotswolds and because I'm elderly, we're locked down. Yes, well I'm locked down too um, because of a health condition I have and so um, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? Sort of not being able to uh, leave our houses. And I'm sure, especially for somebody like you, who's sort of travelled the world a lot uh, in recent well, I'm years. Well, travelling the world in virtual reality at the moment. I think this is interview number 73 or 4 since lockdown wow. began. Oh, well, there you go. So I've got a lot of comp competition before me, but there we are. <laughs> um, I promise I won't be the most professional of interviewers, but hopefully I'll be a friendly one. I'm sure you, you I know you've had discussions in the past with people who are perhaps less than friendly in terms of uh, having opposing views to you. But I would imagine that your views and mine broadly align. I'm sure that if we tried hard enough, we could find some areas of disagreement. But essentially, from what I've known of you anyway, it would seem like uh, we're more or less on the same side. <laughs> um, so, John, um, Oxford at the moment is obviously in the news with things like uh, the, the virus um, study being run out of um, Oxford, the vaccine being run out of Oxford, uh, the largest epidemiological study um, being out, run out of Oxford. There seems to be a sort of strong commitment to truth actually in Oxford because there's this desire instead of just throwing drugs around to actually find out if they work or not. And I wonder what you think a little bit because I know your whole specialism really is the sort of philosophy of science and I wondered what you, know, what you think about that because to me that search for truth, in a way, has its roots in the belief that there's a truth to be found, maybe even oh, an ultimate ab truth. Absolutely right. And the motto of Oxford, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, is rooting that truth very firmly in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Could, could you translate that for those of us who are a bit Latin challenged? Well, uh, the Lord is my light, or the Lord is my illumination. In other words, there's a transcendent source of truth. And, and this, is, this is such a fundamental area. In fact, just before we came on, I was watching Jordan Peterson, who, like you, is a psychiatrist. And oh, he's he was, a psychologist, actually, just to make the distinction. No, not at all. I'm a pure mathematician. <laughs> but I've been interested in psychology since childhood, particularly yeah. through the works of Paul Tournier, and Piaget, I've, I've read quite a bit because I'm interested in the, in the human mind and the human condition in general. But Peterson makes a very powerful point that the very cornerstone if, of our Western civilization indeed is the notion that human beings are made in the image of God and that God spoke creation into existence and he analyzes this speech uh, phenomenon as indicating not only the importance of communication but the importance of true communication mm. and I, I think you're right if we look at the rise of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries with Galileo and Kepler and Newton and so on. These were people who did believe that objective truth was to be found. It was accessible and it was guaranteed by God, even though we had to search for it. And that seems to me to be the foundation for science, which means that in practical terms, I'm not remotely ashamed to be both a scientist in that sense and a Christian, because I think the two things are very intimately entwined and in fact you mentioned epidemiology i am at green templeton college and green college in the old days before it became green templeton was and still is the heart of epidemiology with sir richard Dahl and sir richard pito and some very distinguished people doing these large trials and it's great to see that oxford is at the forefront of this yeah, I mean, quite literally, um, Oxford could sort of save, save the day as well, as it were, for the whole planet, which is quite, quite encouraging. I mean, we'll see, but obviously there's the vaccine trial. But equally, just things like proving that this a malaria drug, which everyone was going so excited about, actually doesn't work, but also proving that a good old-fashioned steroid drug does work for COVID. Yeah, and, and that, that's kind of quite matter. remarkable. That's quite, it, it really quite... matters. It's truth, doesn't it? Truth matters. Truth matters amazingly and you know 
when I talk to people of a more postmodern um, viewpoint, truth matters to them as well. A, a friend of mine once said that postmodern people only think that truth is relative in areas that are of no real importance. But <laughs> anything of real importance, truth matters. There's no such thing as a postmodern bank manager. <laughs> yes, bank quite. We're, and, we're just, you know, the numbers on the bank account can be whatever you want them to be. Okay. Yeah, exactly. If I want a million pounds, I can have a million pounds. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and I tried to point that out because it's very interesting. Uh, the very heart of that relativistic view is to state there's no such thing as absolute truth, but that statement is regarded as an absolute truth. So exception yeah. is made for the speaker's view. And of course, that's totally inconsistent. So you're yeah. dead right. We start thinking, all of us, in fact, believe in the importance of truth. I believed you that you were coming on at exactly 10 o'clock this morning. And so, I was here slightly early, in fact. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> uh, exactly. And that matters. And we, we, we also believe that, uh, you know, we're not going to sort of, I don't know, draw out a sword and slash each other, which I mean, maybe is where the handshake comes from. I don't know. But, uh, you know, we're going, to, we're going to be peaceful when we meet. I mean, obviously, that's the well, issue that, with the virtual thing. You but. see... When I, when I grew up in Northern Ireland, as you can tell from my accent, one of the most interesting and formative things that my parents got across to me, living in a sectarian culture where there was a lot of tension between Protestants and Catholics, my father ran a store where he tried to employ equally across the divide. Oh, and wow. That That's that quite something. That cost bombs. And really? I once said to him, Dad, why do you do it? Well, he said, I do it because of this thing in Genesis that all men and women, no matter what they believe, are made in the image of God and, and therefore Wonderful. we must respect them. And I've lived with that all my life. I mean, you mentioned that I've often debated with people that diametrically oppose my views and sometimes do it uh, fairly <laughs> vigorously. <laughs> But that principle has stuck with me. And, and therefore, you're right. I expect to meet people and be as friendly as possible under the circumstances. I, I think it is possible to state truth and at the same time respect people. And yeah. sometimes that's a bit of a battle, but I think that is the objective. And it's what society desperately needs is the open forum of public discourse discourse yeah. where I protect your right to disagree with me. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I can't remember the uh, the famous quote that sort of says, I profoundly disagree with you, but I would die uh, to allow you yes, the right to say what exactly. you believe. And I've, I've misquoted it, I'm sure. Uh, you mentioned actually Jordan Peterson a bit earlier on. And I think this is one of the things that he's been pushing. And the fascinating thing is that, you know, he'll come on stage and sort of say some things which kind of challenge a lot of certainly postmodern thinking and a lot of popular culture by saying things like truth matters, by saying things like what you do matters, that taking responsibility for your own words and your own actions matter. Uh, for, but, and by saying actually that transcendence matters and having some kind of belief uh, in something that goes beyond yourself, some sense of legacy, some sense of things are beyond just what's in front of your nose, all of those things. And he even talks about God and says that he thinks everybody should live as though they believe in God. And I guess his argument is if you don't believe in truth, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in something transcendent, why are we not just all savages? Well, exactly. He, uh, the bit I was watching this morning is where he says that he's talking about the image of God in human beings. And he says, man, <laughs> and I'm almost quoting, you neglect that at your peril because it's the cornerstone of Western civilization. And I think he's dead right. And the wonderful thing about his presentations is that he's coming at it in such a way that he's opening up some ancient literature, the Bible, mm -hmm. but he's doing it in such a way that resonates with contemporary people because he's showing that it makes sense when you start to 
unpeel the onion and get beneath the surface. And that I find enormously refreshing. Of course, he's extremely bright. Yes, yes. He has got a, a, a massive intelligence. But, but also with that, and I think this is something you share, the ability to communicate complicated matters in a simple way. And that's certainly what I've always tried to do too. I think, you know, people watching this, they, they, they're not necessarily professors. They're not necessarily huge IQs. And so they need to have these complicated arguments explained for them in ways that, that, that they can understand. And I've always thought that, you know, when you listen to some people, they're not able to do that. And that's more their fault than the fault of the listener. I, I think if someone can't understand uh, what you're saying, you know, you should do a better job of explaining it. But that's, that's another philosophy. Cool no, well, that's, that's, that's pure C.S. Lewis, you know. <laughs> Is it really? Uh, I, I, oh. I know I've read quite a bit of C.S. Lewis, so maybe that seeped in somewhere from that. Oh, well, C.S. Lewis, whom I used to listen to, which dates me, in Cambridge mm. in 1962. Yeah, he, I was not even a... He's famous for saying that, that if a person cannot explain what they believe in words that the average person can understand either a they don't believe it or b they don't understand it and yeah. he's got this lovely expression which i remind myself of frequently and it's this i will be understood in other Perfect. words that yes. desire to be understood and that has motivated me deeply and that's why mm. i'm always looking for analogies and story i had a brilliant mentor by the way who was a professor of classics who sadly uh, died at the age of 93 or four last year, Professor David Gooding. But he taught me a huge amount about understanding and explicating literature in ways, particularly biblical literature, in ways that people could access and resonate with. So I, I try to practice that as best I can. Mm. And you've got a, an extensive sort of back catalogue, both of books and of interviews and of debates that you've done. And um, I thought at this point, I might put you on the spot a little bit for people who've, who've never sort of come across your work. And it is possible that some people out there haven't. Um, because I think, you know, apologetics, uh, which I guess is, is that first of all a label you like, the word apologetics? Is that what you, would you no. with that? No, you don't. Oh, that's interesting. So we'll talk about that in a second. I have got a but, reason for not liking that term. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's start there. Why don't you like that term then? Well, because apologetics is not an English word. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. it, it is a straight transliteration, not translation, of a Greek word, apologia. And that word, if translated, would simply mean defense. And the difficulty is that once you use the word apologetics, particularly in a Christian context, and a secular person hearing it for the first time may think, A, that you're apologizing for something mm -hmm. which you're mm -hmm. not. But secondly, many Christians think it's a subdivision of philosophy 101. This is for intellectuals. This is dealing with all kinds of complex arguments and, and so on. Now, mm. it isn't either of those things necessarily. Apologia means defense. And where it occurs in the New Testament, it's mostly in connection with Paul being put on trial and having to defend his stance as a Christian. And mainly he does that by talking about his encounter on the Damascus Road. So his mm. His main defense is his living experience of God. And why I don't like the word is people come along to me and say, oh, you're clever. You're into apologetics. I could never do that. And I say, just right. half a minute. Uh, we're all called, actually, to give a defense. And your main defense is your experience. We can all share experience. No one can take that away from you. So that... It's getting started on the wrong foot, I think. And uh, I think it was um, Peter May, uh, a doctor whom you may know, who I know of him, yeah. very involved in the UCCF and so on. Mm -hmm. And he said a better word would be persuasive evangelism. In other words, you're mm -hmm. putting forward argument. But I do believe very firmly in the intellectual defense of Christianity. And that's something that's been important to me since teenage. It started very early. Yeah, me, me too. I, I remember 
studying up all those arguments for and against the resurrection of Jesus in order That's that right. I could do a debate uh, type of format in my school just as a, I don't know, 17 year old or something. Um, and uh, it does work for some people. I think there are some people who feel that uh, those kind of intellectual arguments never bring people to Christ. And I, and I think I would agree that they don't on their own, but I think they can certainly help because people will have intellectual objections uh, to, to, to the gospel. They'll have beliefs, let's just call it that, that, that stand opposed to Christianity. Maybe they've just been taught that there is no God or, and it's hard for someone to worship a God they don't believe in. So I think there's a definite place. But I also think you're right that there's something about that encounter with God, that uh, emotional uh, resonance, if you like. And part of that is everyone else's stories, of course. I think, you know, particularly perhaps when we hear stories of people handling suffering. And one of the things going back to uh, Jordan for just a second, he, he says is that life is suffering. And you might not know that. And many people don't know that. They go through life and, and don't experience it. But all you've got to do is wait. You know, the older you get, the more likely it is that something awful is going to happen to you. And for many people, I guess, this recent coronavirus has been, you know, one of the most dramatic and awful things that's happened to them. But guess what? There's plenty more coming. And somehow any philosophy, any theology, any religion, any faith, any worldview, any mindset, if you like, whatever we want to call it, has to deal with that suffering. So, so I wonder, for you personally, I, I guess at your age, you must have gone through uh, a journey of life and a journey of faith. Uh, and I wonder, perhaps it's not a question people ask you that often, because of all this sort of intellectual side. But could you just talk a little bit about your own faith and your own encounter with God and your own journey with God? I guess that's something you can talk about forever. But can I just give you a few minutes to outline, if you like, your emotional case for your faith? Well, I first saw Christianity in my parents, and it was real for them. It made a moral difference. And I can well remember my father apologizing to us as children. And that had a deep effect on us because it showed us that he believed in a standard that was outside himself. And that made it much easier for us to believe that. So it, it was very living in that way. And I cannot remember a time when I didn't believe in God. I would have defended the Christian faith from the word go. But I knew from what I'd been taught that you're not born a Christian. You have to become a Christian. But when I actually uh, transited from one to the other, it is very difficult to, to remember. So the important steps for me were really when I got to Cambridge in, in 62 and found my faith in Christ under attack. Now, a lot of that attack was, was intellectual attack. But the practice, I got involved very early on in attempting because I couldn't see how you could be a Christian without spreading it. Uh, and therefore, I was engaged from the word go with other people. And of course, as you got to know them, you got to know a lot about suffering by observing it. And it seems to me there are two issues, and they've raised their heads with coronavirus. There's the person who's actually suffering from COVID-19, and there are the rest of us who watch it. And... We've got to give answers in both directions. The people who watch often have more intellectual questions than people who are suffering, whose questions are deeply emotional. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me how I can get alongside people like that, well, speaking personally, I have been in a position where due to uh, a heart condition, I had to say goodbye to my wife because they thought I was at the edge of a massive heart attack. My right coronary was blocked and they realized it far too late. They thought it was just medically treatable angina. So I went through that experience. Now, it was a very rapid experience. But one of the very interesting things about it looking back was the calm and the peace that I had at the time. And I really believe that let me put it this way, it sounds a bit crude, that God does his stuff in the situation, not in advance of it, but in it. And when I said goodbye to my wife, uh, 
I had a great sense of peace. I'll see you again. It'll be temporary because the medics all expected me to die. Mm. And when they'd finished operating, the surgeon said, well, I don't know what to say to you because you should be dead. And he explained why. So I'd been through that. But most of my experience of suffering has been, in that sense, by proxy, getting to know people and having to face these questions. It's interesting. I've done a lot of lecturing around the world in major universities. And the number one topic by far is where is God in the, the suffering arena, either with coronavirus or with 9-11 or being in New Zealand a few days after the earthquake and having to talk to people that have lost relatives. So it's, it's one of the oldest questions in the world, isn't it? Sorry? It's one of the oldest questions in the world. It's um, the oldest question in the world, but it's also the hardest question mm -hmm. that you said it correctly. Any worldview has to face. And mm -hmm. a worldview that doesn't grapple with this problem is not worthy of consideration actually so it's yeah. the big question but it's the most important question and, and i'm i one of the books i've read on this subject uh, one of the few books i've read on this subject and it took me a long time to get through it but that, that was more my fault than the books um was by tim keller and um, he, he has a book called walking with god through pain and suffering um and he starts by actually doing an overview of all the different philosophies that, that he could sort of find and and their their um, handling on suffering and his conclusion, actually, which is quite interesting, is that the modern, if you like, culture, the post-Christian culture, the post-modern Western culture, is the single worst culture that's ever existed about, about dealing with this issue. Because it essentially has no answer. Because if that's we right. are just random, you know, outcomes of, of random evolution, why should it matter that you and I suffer? You know, why, why, should it, why should it be any more important that you were lying in that hospital bed potentially about to die of a heart attack? Than, than, the, than the bird that unfortunately got eaten by a cat in my garden just recently. You know, what's the difference morally? Well, there isn't the any. There isn't any. And it interests me greatly that Richard Dawkins, whom, as you know, I've grappled with several times, mm -hmm. really lets the cat out of the bag where he says that this universe is just as you'd expect it to be. If at bottom there's no good, no evil, no justice, DNA just is and we dance to its music. Now the interesting thing there is that his taking his atheism to its logical conclusion actually removes the concept of good and evil. And it brings us back to the way you put it a moment ago. Why should we care? That's just brute fact. That's just how it is. And I once put it to him and I said, this is really grim. And uh, he said, yes, it's grim, but that doesn't mean it's false. Yes, I said, that's absolutely right, but it doesn't mean it's true either. And if you're going to have to go to the extent of denying the existence of good and evil, then stop please talking about the problem of evil and yes. stop complaining because yeah. you're, well, I've often put it to people that the problem with atheism here starts right at the beginning in approaching suffering. It doesn't do anything at all about the suffering. It's still there. And also it could make it 10,000 times worse because atheism removes all hope, yes, by exactly. definition, all ultimate hope, that is. Yeah, I mean, you might have hope in the short term, the doctors will sure, help you, but, of course. but yes, you're right. You know, you would not have been able to say to your wife, I'll see you again, um, no, if you didn't have a hope not. in the resurrection. Uh, yes. And that's, that's the critical thing, isn't it? And it's, it's a funny thing, in an effort to get rid of the difficult question, if you like, of, you know, how can there be a good God who's also equally powerful. I mean, that's the way it's expressed, isn't it? Who, who appears to do nothing. I mean, I've, I've certainly prayed to God, why do you hide yourself in the middle of suffering? I mean, we, yeah, that sure. struggle is essential, essential to the human condition. And you try and erase that struggle by, by an atheist view of life. Well, there is no God, so we don't have to worry about his view of it. But as you say, all it really does is gets rid of the hope. It does indeed. And, and therefore, in that context, uh, I think it's very important to point to the evidence that there is hope. And as you say, 
the two sides of Easter, the death of Christ and the fact that if he is who he claimed to be, then this tells us something about God's attitude to suffering, that he didn't remain distant from it, but became himself part of it. And then the other side is the resurrection, that there is hope beyond death because Jesus has risen from the dead. And Paul's metaphor is absolutely brilliant. It's, he's the first fruits of a great harvest. And resurrection is promised to all who trust him. So we've got something to say into yes. this kind of scenario that atheism just does not have. And therefore, I think it's very important to put that forward, as I tried to do in my little book on coronavirus recently. Yes, no, that's that's wonderful, and uh, I don't have a copy of that book to show. But there's a when I do post this, I'll put a um, link also to a re recent interview you did where you talked about the whole of that. One of the things that you mentioned in that interview, um, which I suppose you've just touched on just now as well, is this idea of, of Jesus entering into our suffering. And you took the example specifically of Lazarus when he died, and Mary and Martha. And I thought, what a wonderful um, example to take, because to me, I've often thought that some of the most precious um precious um verses in the whole bible in fact maybe the most precious verse in the whole bible is also the shortest one where it says jesus wept and i like to think of jesus you know looking at suffering and not just what was in front of him but all the way down through human history and and in that moment entering in uh to our suffering and also then entering into our suffering himself just a few weeks later on, on the cross i mean could you maybe talk a bit more about that and how that's a comfort to you at difficult times well, I think that helps answer your earlier questions and observations in that that story is a microcosm of what happens daily around the world. And certainly COVID-19 has drawn itself to our attention because of its scale. But we need to remember every tragedy is an individual tragedy for a nuclear family. And that story in John where you've got two sisters, Martha and Mary, and their brother. It raises all the questions. And just looking at it briefly, Lazarus, their brother, was ill. Jesus was miles away, but was a friend of the family. So they sent a message, and it simply said, Lord, the one you love is ill. And of course, they expected him to come, but he didn't come. And that raises the question. He was at a distance. He didn't come. And they, sisters, watched this man slowly get worse and then die. So what were they to make of Jesus and his claims? Why was he so distant? And that's exactly what people are saying today. And when Jesus did arrive, Martha met him first. And she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that's very revealing. It shows that she believed he had the power to save her brother from death. So he was powerful. And here this refers to your semi-quotation of Hume and Lucretius. Yes. You know, if God is all powerful and all loving. So it was raising the question, look, you had the power, but you didn't come. It's unspoken. It almost brought her to doubt the love of God. And then he addresses her and says, your brother will rise again, which is wonderful because he didn't say Lazarus will rise again. Your brother, there's something about relationship in this world that is transferable to the next world, so to speak. Now, I could spend time on that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and they enter into a discussion about resurrection. And Martha was well-schooled. She said, I know he rise again, the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus looks at her and he says, I am the resurrection and the life, which is a startling discussion. He that <clears throat> believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. So he's associating himself with being the resurrection in the sense that it's his voice is going to activate it. Now, he's shortly to demonstrate that, but it hadn't happened yet. And at that point, Martha remembers her sister and Mary arrives and she says identical words. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So here are two sisters saying exactly the same thing, but it's coming from a totally different temperament. Because 
when Mary has said that, she starts to weep. And then mm. Jesus doesn't then start talking to her about the resurrection, but he weeps. And that shows me the sensitivity of Jesus, of God, to our human situation. Martha needed intellectual answers. She got them. Mary needed to hear and see someone weeping. In other words, who emotionally empathized. And of course, it raises deep questions. Were those crocodile tears? And your answer, it seems to me, is correct. No, they were not, because Jesus was soon to die for all of them in order that the relationship with God and the resurrection could actually be real. So that little story seems to me to raise many of the issues that suffering evil in whatever form, COVID-19, earthquakes, cancers, raise. Yeah, and, and of course, the, the, those ones that are very definitely caused by human beings as well. I mean, going back to... Well, moral we were, evil, yes. Yeah, I mean, going back to what we were saying about you know, the, the idea that God is dead, the idea that there is no God, um, many people would argue that it was not an accident that the century that came after those statements, the 20th century, was perhaps the most deadly and most evil century that we've mankind ever produced in terms of totalitarian regimes that were all That's atheist right. and that killed so many, many people and that didn't and, and did act as though, you know, the strong should survive and the weak should uh, be evolved out of existence. Well, that was believed by both the Nazis and the Russians and the Chinese. And, you know, I, I, I think that pandemics and earthquakes act as a wake-up call. Every death raises this question, of course. And one notices, and it's been very noticeable, the effect of the pandemic on online church attendance. Yes. Yes, the last interview I did was with the Evangelical Alliance, who've done a report that said 70% of UK churches are growing. I mean, that's not something I expected to say at this point in 2020. No, it isn't. And it shows that the, this kind of event raises bigger questions. What is my context in life? What is death? Is there an eternity? Is there a God? Will I have to meet him? And it's quite clear from the online church attendance, one in four of UK and one in three of young people, apparently, just yes, that's the statistic I read this morning, yeah. shows that God has set eternity in people's hearts, as a famous philosopher once said. Yeah, and, and, it, and you're right. It's so vital that in our... Um, talking about our faith with people that we address these issues head on you know and i think some christians unfortunately don't i mean one of the things um, that got me going in my my first foray into writing a book um, was actually this issue of the resurrection because i noticed that in a lot of churches there was a huge focus on the cross and people would talk about the cross of jesus being the answer for our sin and penal substitution and the punishment and and, and all of that which i believe in all of that but there, was, there wasn't much emphasis on what we've just talked about with, with the idea that the cross being Jesus entering into our suffering, uh, Jesus identifying with our suffering, experiencing our suffering, and then conquering death and coming back. And uh, to my shame, there were, there were many sermons that I preached, or even a gospel tract that I produced as a young man when I used to go to Speaker's Corner that didn't even mention the resurrection. It was as though Jesus' resurrection was just something nice for him, that at least he, at least he, did, you know, he got to survive. Uh, saving us but actually to me now I, I came to the realization that perhaps the resurrection is even more important than the cross in our proclamation it's fascinating when you look at the book of acts because actually it's the resurrection they talk about you know oh, everyone there knew that jesus had died everyone there knew about suffering i guess suffering was much more real to them day to day than it is to us but this idea that there is a, a chance of defeating death that that's the answer isn't it i think so and when christianity broke on the world it was the announcement of the resurrection. And I think it's C.S. Lewis who said, if the resurrection hadn't ha happened, no one would ever have heard of Jesus. And I think that's absolutely right. And in the 21st century, where we are dominated, I fear, both in the academy and in the media by naturalism, by a denial of the supernatural, we need to concentrate on this. 
and we need to give evidence and reason for it. I was very interested in the survey done a few years ago by Michael Burke, I think it was, for the BBC, asking people why they left the church. And the major reason by far was they don't answer our questions. Wow. And I think that we need to be very careful. Within the Christian context of church, sadly, many sermons are not related to people. And I've developed the habit when I preach from time to time, often of just taking a notebook with me and standing there and saying, well, you probably had an interesting week. What are your questions? And people look at you aghast. And then I say, I'm serious. Let me write down your questions. And gradually the questions flow and I write them down. I spend the next half hour answering them. This yeah. idea of an interactive pulpit or better getting people off the pulpit down level with the people and engaging with them, to my mind, is very important. The communication of Christianity at the dialogue level is a neglected art Mm. No, I think you're absolutely right. Now, a while ago, I was going to ask you a question, and I, I'm going to ask, ask it now. Um, so of all of your resources, whether that's, well, let's say a video and a book, um, let's say somebody uh, who's not a Christian at the moment, and, um, you know, it, but it, maybe they're facing a challenge of suffering that's made them, made them sort of sit up and be, take interest and think, hang on, my atheism isn't really answering this. So which, which one book and one video would you recommend people watch of yours? Well, if it's directly on the question of suffering, mm -hmm. I'll name the short book, and that's Where is God in the Coronavirus World? Because and that's, that's, the, that's your more, most recent book, although there's another one coming which we'll get to. But yeah, yes. is that right? That, that summarizes the argument. But if they want a bit more meat, mm -hmm. I've written a book called Gunning for God why the new atheism doesn't hit the target. But basically, that book was written in response to a debate I had with Christopher Hitchens. It's the moral argument against God, which is often more common and more accessible. And there I've done quite a lot of talking about uh, writing about the problem of suffering and the way it's dealt with. And, and so that debate with Christopher Hitchens is presumably online as well. So oh, it's all that. online. I have a website, you see, yeah. and people might be wise to go there first because yeah. all they need to do if they want to have something on suffering is look at johnlennox.org or mm -hmm. Google my name and New Zealand because someone has collected the talks I gave in universities and churches and on radio and television about this topic and it's obviously in a much more compressed form mm -hmm. but th those are the books oh. that... <laughs> that's okay <laughs> sorry apologies I, for that that's I've no un problem it's, i've it's unplugged it i thought i had <laughs> it's quite all right mine hasn't gone off yet so but maybe it will <laughs> Yeah, so okay, so that's that's great then. So um I'll certainly put links to that when I when I post that as well. That will give people some things to do. But I guess one of the things that we've sort of touched on a little bit is this idea that we come at, at the world with a sense of our own identity and our own place in the world and, and this sense that we exist and that we matter somehow and other people matter somehow. This sense of consciousness, which I guess is what makes us different from from you know the, the creatures and um I, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about that this idea of intelligence in, in its of, of itself this idea of the mind um which i think uh, is is something quite unique and you know obviously it's that really that gives us the problem because if we weren't aware of ourselves we wouldn't care that we were suffering but it also gives us the ability to hope and to think about the future and to believe or not believe in a creator so what do you think about the origin of the mind if you like well i think a great deal about it I don't understand a great deal about it because no one knows what consciousness is, but clearly it's absolutely fundamental. And the great problems that face 
the rational mind at the moment, the scientific mind, are firstly the origin of, of life itself, uh, which is still an intractable question, but even harder than that is the origin of consciousness. And if we look at worldviews, take the two polar opposite worldviews, that is the atheistic worldview and the theistic worldview and uh, the Christian worldview. They are polar opposites in the following sense that the atheistic worldview starts with mass energy or these days more popularly it starts with nothing and derives something and then in a bottom-up kind of argument, a reductionist argument that is, because everything's determined by physics and chemistry, it eventually produces consciousness and mind. Whereas the Christian worldview starts with consciousness and mind. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And interestingly, in that profound statement with which John begins his gospel, mass and energy, the universe, is derivative. And it says that explicitly. All things came to be through him. That's a more literal translation of the Greek language there. It's talking about existence. And the word, which is God, never came to be. The word already was in the beginning. But we and the universe, we came to be as a result of the word. So it's a conscious mind, whatever that means, the mind of mm. God that speaks the world into existence and defines the parameters of human existence. Now, for me, that is really important and it's very encouraging to hear Jordan Peterson affirm that in the way he does. Mm. Yes, because, I mean, there really is two choices, isn't there? One is that I suppose, in a way, our consciousness is almost an illusion, really. It's just the product of our neurons firing in a certain way. And the other, I would argue, is the sense that perhaps that's one of the main ways in which we exist in the image of God. That our very oh, surely. Consciousness... And mm. if, if <laughs> you remind me of a debate I had with Michael Shermer, the editor of Skeptic Magazine. Oh, yes. Which, by the way, uh, there's a clip from it in the film that I have made, but that's another story. A, a film, a documentary will come out in the aut autumn. Um, What's that called so we can look out for it? Oh, it's called Against the Tide. And oh, it's been made with a very well-known Hollywood actor, Kevin Sorbo, who was Hercules and Andromeda and all this kind of stuff. And he comes to Oxford and interviews me about the science and God. And then we go to Israel and we talk about the historicity of Christianity. Well, that sounds wonderful. It's been a most interesting process, very difficult, but I found it fascinating. But in it, there's a clip from Shermer who says that consciousness is just the firing of a billion neurons or something like that. Hmm. And that kind of reductionism, John Polkinghorne, who taught me quantum theory at, at Cambridge, pointed out long ago that that reductionism actually is suicidal. It defeats itself because if it's true, we'd never know it. This yes, nothing quite. but, it's nothing but, yeah. is the telltale indicator of a reductionist explanation. And Polkinghorne yeah. just ends that none of us believe that. It, can't, it simply cannot well, be yeah. true. I mean, just as one example that struck me from my professional background as a psychiatrist, one of the things that I was often asked to do um, would be to take a short walk from the hospital I was working at down to the court. And um, I would be asked to interview people who were at that point presenting, usually with relatively minor offences. And the question I was asked to ask was, were they mentally unwell or not? And if they were mentally unwell, you know, should we divert them from the justice system and move them across into the health system. And it's really fascinating that right at the very core of our kind of sense of justice, there is this notion that if I have an illness, if there's something wrong with my brain, you know, an, an extreme example would be if someone blew away the frontal lobe and so I had no sort of sense of self-control, or if I have schizophrenia and I hear voices that are telling me to do things, I am, I, I, and whatever I is, 
I'm no longer responsible for my actions and I should be seen as a victim in a sense and a, a patient and be treated and taken care of. And, and yes, maybe I might still be at risk to other people, so I might need to be detained, but it's very different from the notion of actually holding someone to account and you know, being a judge and saying, no, oh, you mustn't do that. You've just done something that means you should go to prison. So it's kind of very fascinating that right at the core of our, of our society's sense of justice is this notion that there is this mind that is somehow responsible and accountable. And, and I guess that's one of the things Jordan Peterson also talks about. Actually, oh, he it? does. He does indeed. And again, coming from his perspective, that, that's hugely important. Because, as he said, this is the cornerstone of our justice system. If we're not accountable and we're simply deterministic automata uh, as one alternative explanation, then DNA just is and we dance to its music and he can't blame us for it. And uh, civilization ends at that point. So the existence of morality, the courts, the police and everything else is predicated on the assumption that we are to a large degree responsible and mm. people want to be held responsible. Uh, again, watching this morning, Peterson said the most awful thing for an individual to hear is you're not responsible. And it's, it's, mm. it's, it, it, it really um, is an affront to our, for the normal person, to our concept of ourselves. And totalitarian regimes, of course, have uh, adopted this business of saying, well, we decide, the scientists or the medics decide whether you're normal or not. And if you're not, we will put you into some kind of exclusion until you become normal. And of course, that is hideous. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it's really interesting, isn't it? This concept of the mind and intelligence. And, and you've just written another book, um, which uh, we, we will spend the remaining time talking about, but it's a nice way into it because um, this is a book on artificial intelligence. And I guess one of the immediate questions that comes to my mind is, you know, will a computer ever be conscious in the way that a human is? And secondly, how do we hold a computer accountable? I mean, it's the old question, isn't it? Um, just as simple as if we've got an artificially intelligent car driving on the road and um, someone runs out in front of it and uh, it, it, it causes an accident, either killing the individual it ran over or perhaps swerving and hitting a lamppost and killing the person that's uh, being taken there in the car, you know, which should the computer do? And who's responsible? Is it the person that bought the car? Is it the manufacturer of the car, the person who wrote the code? Or is there some way that we'll ever be able to hold computers to account? Well, you've asked about six questions. I have, so I'll, let, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you at least six minutes to answer them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think one of the reasons I wrote this book was to try and disentangle the different levels and to try and take some of the science fiction out of one aspect of artificial intelligence. But I would want to start with the fact that there are really two kinds and they're very different. Narrow artificial intelligence is usually the doing of one thing, one single thing that normally requires a human intelligence to do, but doing it in an automated fashion. And we bring into that then the idea of large databases. Now in the medical field, an easy example is x-rays, that you take a million x-rays of people's lungs and you get the top uh, experts on lung disease to label them with the diseases that they have. And then you or I uh, have trouble breathing and there's an x-ray taken and the AI system which is a computer, of course, compares the picture of my lungs with the million. And it pops out and says, well, the diagnosis is this. And it's probably a better diagnosis these days than you'll get from your local hospital. So that works, it's doing a single thing. But then of course- the, It'd be like playing chess is another example. That's sorry? Been... It would be like playing chess. That's an example that the computer's been better at for a long time. So. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And some of that is extremely useful. But of course, there are ethical problems even with that. Because yeah. 
narrow AI is the stuff that is being used to drive autonomous cars. And you put up the obvious ethical problem. And clearly, uh, ethics has to be built into the system. The system isn't itself an ethical entity by any means, nor is it a conscious entity. There's a lovely paper written many years ago by a man called Melly Champ, and it called this the artificial in artificial intelligence is real. Mm. No, I think that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's brilliantly put. It's brilliantly one of the questions that has been around for a long time was this idea of could a computer ever con someone into thinking it was real? Oh, but well, that's, that's the different. Turing test. Yes, the Turing test. And of course, people are trying that. But even if it did, it's simulating a human response isn't the same thing as being human. Yeah. But what could, you could were referring to... What you were referring to earlier, uh, artificial general intelligence, that's the attempt to um, build something that is super intelligent, that's human-like in all directions. And we're nowhere near that. And the biggest barrier is consciousness. How can we build a conscience, a consciousness when we don't even know what it is? And I've read a great deal about it because it interests me, of course. And the honest people, uh, they can, of course, tell things about our brain story and our mind story. And if you're a Dan Dennett, you believe the two are the same. But if you're a John Lennox, you believe the two are very different. I can, you could tell me if you've got a computer tomography system or something, something about my brain story and what lights up when various things are suggested to me. But you can't read my mind story. I can't read my brain story, but I can read my mind story. So it seems to me there's a profound uh, differentiation to be made between those two. And we're in front of an absolute, what, appears to be an impenetrable brick wall, which doesn't, of course, mean that I'm a Luddite and a science stopper. I think we need to do the science because the more we do it, the more complex we're going to see that this whole business is. So reading the prophets of the future, there are those that expect a computer to be conscious within 40 years. It's always about 40 years, you probably noticed that you're yes. Yeah, it's safe, isn't it? And no there are others that out. think there are others that think it is not going to happen. But there's enough fear around for people to try to build serious ethics in. I think it was Max Tegmark of Princeton, or was it Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking said we really need to uh, put up some ethical framework because the danger of creating a super intelligence is that we'll all be redundant and it will simply destroy us. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point, isn't it? How, how could a computer have empathy? You know, yeah, and, well, exactly. Because uh, isn't empathy partly dependent on, or largely dependent on that sense of self and it that is. sense of the other? It is, but, but there's... There's something very interesting here, Adrian. I don't know whether you've come across Rosalind Picard. She is a top AI computer expert at MIT in the States. She's also a Christian. But she works on a thing called affective computing. Oh, and one of the most interesting things is she's using this, uh, including very advanced facial recognition uh, technology to read the faces of say autistic children or people liable to seizures and you need to read it for yourself but she's gone a long way in this direction of producing something that is able to respond to emotional signals and actually has now been patented and is being used to help people avoid crises in terms of seizures and so on. So there is something there that is being done and being successfully done. Yeah, but I guess what that's doing is looking at a face and labeling what emotion or what is happening mentally in that face. It's not quite the same as the computer 
understanding our pain. Oh, no, 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 of course not. (laughs) I I mean, you know, there are some jobs that you sort of think it's going to be an awful long time before a computer replaces, and one of them is surely that of a counsellor. I mean, I know there are some No, I think that's absolutely right. And it is admitted by some of the leading people. There's this question of counselling is mentioned throughout the literature, and I mention it in my book as well. It's a very important area. Although we might be able to do certain things that show some basic level of empathy. You're absolutely right. But of course, you're coming to another huge problem. And that is the way in which AI is going to make many people jobless. Mm. And that is going to create a whole set of new problems that as any industrial revolution does, just in this case, it's going to be probably the biggest. I think you're absolutely right. And of course, we're seeing with COVID-19 a huge rise in unemployment. And um, many of these jobs, you almost get the feeling are just not going to return, at least not in the short term. So already we're seeing some of that. And uh, perhaps it takes a crisis, a reset sometimes to make that clear. And I wonder how you know, how the future will look for people. I mean, what, where will the jobs be in the future? Well, I don't regard myself as a prophet, hmm. but it is clear that many things are going to have to change. Our interaction at the moment with Zoom, that's become a very powerful platform and it has huge advantages. I mean, it has saved me a fortune in terms of both time and expense. I yeah. don't have to travel to Australia uh, to do uh, a lecture, for example, or America. Mm. And I'll be traveling to Australia in a couple of days' time to be interviewed and uh, in cyberspace. So that's a huge advantage. And I think we're going to think twice before we jump on a plane, apart mm. from the danger of being exposed, of course, to COVID-19 and and traveling, there are going to be huge differences. And I I think that being locked down, it it raises a lot of questions about, do we need all the things that we have? And have we, there are things that we haven't done for a long time, have we missed them? There are things we do miss. And that's, of course, for me, 10 grandchildren that I haven't seen for a long time and so on. Yeah, I think you're right. It gives us a chance to do something that our society rarely does, which is to stop, think and reflect. And I guess that's, you know, we've spoken about it already, but it's probably why some people are turning to the church online, um, maybe turning to some of these sort of lectures, maybe even watching something like this and asking themselves questions that perhaps in the business of life they never really had a chance to do. So that can only be a good thing for somebody like yourself, who, who it seems to me anyway, your life mission has been to try and help people think of it. Is that right? Yeah, that, that, that is absolutely right. And uh, I'm grateful to you for giving me this very interesting opportunity. Yeah. I really <laughs> feel like we could spend another hour or two talking, but believe it or not... Well, it's certainly I'd be happy to do that out. another time. I think so, yeah. I think this is enough for today, but uh, because it's been really good. And um, But I think you're absolutely right. We, we could certainly uh, do this again at some point. And uh, it's been an absolute privilege to have well, uh, you likewise, know, a great thinker Adrian. like yourself with us, and uh, it, it has sounded at times like we're both fanboys of, Profe- of Professor uh, John Peterson. So, um, but we've just been fun as well. And but it's it's great to see people beginning to think and reason and on all of those things. So hopefully, this video will play a part in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And if Jordan Peterson gets a few more people taking the Bible seriously, I, for one, would be delighted. Yeah, I mean, do you know, I think he takes the Bible more seriously than some Christians do. Oh, he does, very much more seriously, because he's getting more out of it than many Christians. Yeah, so there we go. So on that note, I think perhaps I'll let you go and um, go and get myself a cup of tea, I think. I should have had one here to sit, really. That would have been a good idea. So should you, but it's probably a bit dry now. (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Keep well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye then.